So, um, my name is Simon Bittman. I'm a, a CNRS, I don't know how to call it, research fellow. I, I work for, I'm a full time researcher now, and I'm a sociologist or social, social historian. Uh, as David mentioned, I used to do economics and then I, I migrated, but I actually do economic sociology, if that, that means anything for all of you. But it's like we, we study economic objects through the lens of uh, sociological analysis or political science analysis. So it's very much uh, interdisciplinary. And I'm very happy to present this work in front of uh, what, I, what I think is a very international crowd. Um, since uh, probably most of you are not super familiar with, with some of the, the, the things that we usually refer to in sociology or political science, if you have any questions or things that I assume are clear but they're not, you, you really have not to hesitate but interrupting me and, and ask me for clarifications as the as we move along, because I'm, I think I'm going to appeal to your, <laughs> to your uh, open-mindedness, because uh, we're going to go back in time and, and, and look at a, a, a subject which is, uh, which is not uh, super familiar for most people, which is the history of, uh, of debt in the, in the United States, especially consumer debt. Um, so this was what my PhD was about. Uh, the title that I give here is actually a book that uh, will come out at, with uh, Columbia University Press, I think in like one year or two, but uh, it's still in the process. I'm rewriting the dissertation I originally wrote in French uh, to, uh, to turn it into a book in English. And so uh, I'm going to test today some of the ideas that I try to defend in the book. So I sent a, a paper uh, that was very sociological in a sense that was very uh, about law and finance and it's a uh, it's a, it's from, um, it's a special, uh, it's a special, uh, how do you say, volume that was dedicated to law and finance through a sociological lens. So this is a kind of a new topic, like sociologists don't really like to get into like finance and especially law and everything because it's like, it's double the complication. You have to understand the law and then you have to understand the finance and then you have to, add, to do sociology with all that. So it becomes quite, quite messy, but then I think there's really interesting stuff to do with that. So here I'm going to expand sort of the scope. I'm not going to focus on the paper per se. I'm going to focus on the more general argument of, the, of this work. So, um, so the, the starting point from this dissertation, I guess, was the, I started not so long after the 2008 crisis, which was a while ago, but still, like, it's, it's still relevant to some level. And uh, one of the strange reactions that we, could, um, that we could see after the crisis of the Obama administration at the time was that uh, there was a big subprime mortgage crisis with, with, with all these issues regarding loans and everything. And, and one of the first things that the Obama administration did was to come down really heavily on a set of uh, lenders that go by different names. They, sometimes they're called payday lenders, uh, check, uh, check cashers, uh, even pawnbrokers, like a whole set of, of lenders that primarily cater to uh, the working class, the poor, the underprivileged neighborhoods, and so on. Right? So, these, 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 um, these loan offices have been disseminated throughout the country, but what is really important to understand is they have nothing to do with housing. The, these provide like consumer loans. They have nothing to do with, with mortgages. And despite this, the Obama administration decided to shut down all these, all these agencies, right? So one day to another in American cities, and especially poor, poor neighborhoods, all these like things that you could see around were, were closed down, right? And, it was a strange reaction because it precisely had nothing to do with the big banks and the, and the hedge funds who were dealing in uh, subprime mortgages. And so uh, they created the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, who now, uh, now is a big institution of uh, well, consumer protection, does a lot of different things. And uh, at, the, at its head uh, was put Elizabeth Warren, that you all know because she was a candidate at the last election. So she sort of embodies uh, some of the things that I, I, I'm going to cover in, se in the second section of my topic, which is the, how you deal with, um, with small loans who have what are, what are usually called excessive interest rates for poor people in the United States. And she's the sort of person who completely, like, she made a career out of defend defending uh, fragile consumers against these predatory lenders, saying that they take advantage of the fragility of the working class and so on. So um, I wanted to understand basically like why did the Obama administration did that and how do, can we locate the origin of these uh, uh, credit activities. So that actually led me to something much bigger, which is uh, the history of what people call reverse redlining. So I, I have to make sure first that you all know what redlining is in, in the United States. Probably some of you do. So redlining was a, was a practice that was... Uh, 
during the, the segregation era, actually it lasted until the 80s or the 90s, where um, on certain maps of cities, there was a red line uh, uh, drawn across, like around certain neighborhoods, and bankers were not allowed to issue loans to people who lived inside these neighborhoods. So it is usually the name that we, that we use to qualify housing discrimination when it comes to credit loans for uh, poor people and my minorities in the US. So redlining is really this idea that uh, the financial system played a role in, cre in maintaining discrimination and segregation in American cities. So reverse redlining is, is quite the opposite, is that certain lenders on the opposite, those who ask for excessive interest rates, will specifically target uh, poor and uh, working class and minority neighborhoods because they know that these people don't have any other options than to go to these agencies, right? So it's not a legal definition. Redlining was a legal definition. Reverse redlining is more of a, like a, a so sociological or like historical definition, but it's, it's something that we know very little of. And so my dissertation kind of want to fill the gap on the, on the long history, specifically because we always think that it's something new, that's something that comes from the Reagan era because of the whole the deregulation that came after the, the 80s. And so these companies kind of took a, a larger role, but they actually existed from the early 20th century, some of the things that we'll, we'll cover today. So, um, so one quick question that goes throughout the work is how, when was the, there's a big distinction in the US between these lenders, which are usually referred to as fringe finance, and the mainstream sort of banking system. So it's like, it's, it's really a two tier system. There's two supplies of credit. Uh, the, the, the fringe finance guys don't ask for the credit score. So for a lot of people who have bad credit scores in the US, they can, they can go to these agencies. It's easier, it's, it's faster, but it costs also a lot of money. So it's sort of like endless debate. One of the questions is like, where can we locate this segmentation? Where did it happen? Was it always there, et cetera, et cetera? And, um, and so this led me to a second, which is more like a historical uh, question, question, which is that if you want to go to these lenders, you have to have a job. Basically, they always have these ads running around that say like, your job is your credit, right? Because it's not the credit score. So it's specifically, if you have a job, you can go to these lenders, they give you money, and at the end of the month, or two months or whatever, you pay back with the revenue that you owned during that month. So that was preci precisely the point of the paper I sent in, which is that wages were in a sense turned into a financial asset in a sense that uh, uh, the working class uh, uses their wages as collateral to build debt. And with this credit, they can use this money to do whatever things they need to do in their daily lives. So that explains sort of the title of the book, which is called Wages as Capital, because it, 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 it tried to uh, to, um, to use that, that sort of narrative line to kind of understand, like to look at credit practices through, through that angle. Uh, so of course, this wasn't always the case. And so this led me to a bunch of different questions regarding this, this, this question of uh, assetization of wages, which is, this is the precise question. Uh, so first of all, what uh, structural changes were necessary for this to happen? I mean, if we are in a pre wage earning society, of course, there's not this type of system. This is something that, that is born like in the early, early 20th century. Before that, you don't have factories, not as stable, etc. So you don't have as many wage earners. There's, this type of credit doesn't exist. Second type of question is how did this credit system work? And uh, did these experiences differ according to class, race, and gender, which is something that, again, we, we know uh, very little of. And third question, how was this market regulated and what influence did this have on cons uh, contemporary co consumer finance? Because one of the point of looking at historical stuff is that we can actually draw conclusions for more, more recent uh, uh, phenomenon. So, uh, so what changes were necessary? I'll, I'll go quite quickly on this, but first of all, of course, industrialization, which is, it's always kind of um, hard to, to date precisely, but there, there is, Let's say in the U.S., this is a consensus among historians that there is this sort of second industrialization at the uh, at the turn of the 20th century, where it's not much about like growing industries per se, but it's about the concentration of, of industries. Right? You you all heard of the railroads and and you know all the big oligopolies that we associate with this era, like the Rockefeller and the and the Andrew Carnegie and so on. And so this has a consequence for the workforce in the sense that people get more and more stable jobs. Uh, in the 19th century, in the United States, you have a rate of bankruptcy, of company bankruptcy, that is inc like incredibly high. Like, like uh, companies don't last more than a year or a couple of months, and they have a very hard time like uh, 
uh, getting their money, especially for large, large companies, which, which require a lot of capital. And so at some point, the federal government steps in and uh, acts as a, as a, basically guarantees that these companies would not go bankrupt. They especially do that for the railroads, and this sort of explains the boom in those big industries. So one of the consequences for the workforce is that they could actually have a stable job, which means they were not going to lose it from like month to month. And uh, this leads to some uh, lenders started, who started offering uh, credit based on these wages. So they uh, lended primarily to people who had really stable jobs. Why? Because if you lose your job, then you're not going to be able to repay your debt. So if you target industry workers who are really stable, you have a higher chance that they're going to be good customers for a long time. Um, and it has also different advantages. For instance, if you have a large corporation, it usually has a very separated payroll department, which deals with, with actually paying the workers, right? And so if someone doesn't pay its credit, you don't have to go to the employer and ask for the money. You can go directly to the bureaucracy. And these people don't really care about what's happening, right? So they'll, they'll just sign off on the, on the debt, right? And they'll authorize the garnishment of wages. So uh, to be a little bit more uh, uh, concrete, this is a sort of, uh, of uh, practices we're looking at. So this is, a, this is a wage assignment contract from the early 19, uh, 20th century in, uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, where I did some of my research. And it's a white uh, industry worker who works for uh, the Southern Railway Corporation, which is written there, which was the largest uh, railway corporation in the south of the United States. So it's no surprise that they're overrepresented among these, uh, these, um, uh, these borrowers. And he was a conductor. He lived uh, somewhere on North Avenue. And he borrowed uh, $20. And here it says that basically, I, I this day sell a signed transfer and set over onto the Union Investment Company. That's the name of the creditor doing business in the city of Atlanta, something, something dollars, uh, while I'm in the employ of the Southern Railroad Corporations. And this is the important part. Um, well, whatever. Uh, the salary here, herein aside, it means that basically, like, so this is a credit contract, even though it's not called that. It's called a wage assignment uh, promissory note. That's the technical sense. But it's actually a credit contract, because if the person doesn't pay, then the creditor can go to the employer and seize the salary, so let's say 10, 20, 30 percent, even the whole salary, and send it directly to the credit company. So this is the sort of thing I'm uh, talking about when I'm talking about like legal coding of wages into capital. Like something is actually needs legal like infrastructure, legal actions, efforts to turn something into into capital. Um, so just a, a quick, uh, some quick points on the empirical methodology. One of the difficulties with those objects is that it's very hard to document uh, working class practices in general and from a historical standpoint and working class credit in particular because these people often didn't know how to write, they didn't leave any traces, there's no oral history because it was too long ago. Uh, so some of the things we do as uh, some of the things like uh, historians of, of consumption usually do is that they look at um, judiciary archives. So when someone doesn't pay, it goes in front of a judge, and you have a trace. So this is how I got access to this sort of, uh, of slips. And so you, you know, uh, you, you have information through litigation. So that's, that's a common strategy that I, that I used, and um, that was really interesting. Then another thing I did was to try to get access to private, which I mean like loan company archives, which is not so easy, but it, it happens. Like in the, in the case of Atlanta, I'll show you later, but I found a, an account book of one of the lenders in an African American neighborhood in Atlanta in the in the early 20th century, so that was actually one of the biggest discovery I made throughout my entire archival work was actually coming across an account book. So you can see like how much clients, like how many clients they had, uh, what color they were, like how did how did this system operate? And it, this is very precious uh, as a historian. Uh, the second company I really looked into was is called the, the Household Finance Corporation, which you probably never heard of but is a company that was created in Chicago in the early 20th century. And actually, uh, it was one of the companies that invented uh, subprime mortgages. Like, there were two, but they were, these, they, they were actually the, the biggest one. So in the 1980s, they decided that they were going to make a lot of money out of subprime mortgages. And so uh, they invented sort of, especially like what we call secondary mortgages, which maybe you're not all familiar with, but it's like a, it's a specific type of, uh, of, of asset of whatever. 
Uh, but still, the, the, the household finance uh, uh, funny story is that they were bought by HSBC, the big uh, bank, in 2003. And in 2008, they cost like, like I don't know, 18 billion losses uh, for the bank, right? So they were really happy that five years earlier they had bought the company. But I was really happy because uh, HSBC is an English bank, and English banks have a policy of open archives, which uh, American banks really don't. And so because uh, HFC was bought by HSBC, I could have access to these archives. It was a, it was a huge mess. No one has ever looked into those things. But it was interesting because it's a company that, that goes throughout the, the entire 20th century. And you kind of see the evolution of like, American capitalism through this like, one firm because it, it, it goes all the way to the subprime crisis. So that's for some of the things, I also used a lot of philanthropic archives, which I'll, I'll later come back to, like people who fought against this sort of lender, and so they, they left a lot of traces. Okay, so um, I'm going to study uh, here two, I'm going to go back quickly to um, two case studies uh, that I did to document the, the credit practices. Was, one was in Georgia. Georgia is a, is a state in the south of the United States. It's not the, the country in Eastern Europe. And Illinois, which uh, you all know, has the... the the biggest city in, the, in Illinois uh, would be Chicago. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to compare the two states and kind of see what, what transpires through this, uh, this comparative analysis. So just to start and uh, give a little bit of substance to my talk, um, I'm going to read you a story that uh, comes from a, a, a woman borrower called uh, Lula Nolan, who was an African-American uh, washerwoman. So she, she washed clothes for the, for the white families. It was a big business, actually, in the, at that time. And, um, and her story kind of like had, had, had a lot of um, mediatic coverage at the time. It raised a lot of, uh, of attention. So uh, on August 9, I need to have a little bit of my notes because I tend to forget her story. On August 9, 1903, uh, G.R. Wood, which, uh, a guy named Wood, who was a bailiff. A bailiff is someone who is warranted to go out and actually collect money from when a judge is issues, a, issues a, a judgment. So uh, Mr. Wood, who was a bailiff for a Georgia uh, the magistrate, went to the house of Lula Nolan, an African-American washerwoman residing in an area called Darktown, Atlanta. Uh, and he was uh, set on collecting a debt of 90 cents. So Nolan had originally borrowed $3, and she had paid back uh, $4.50, but she still owed 90 cents, right? So the guy, uh, the lender had gone to the judge, the judge had issued a warrant, the bailiff would go with the warrant in the neighborhood and try to collect the money. Uh, she uh, refused to pay, uh, saying, according to the journalist, she said that no one was going to, to take her bed from under her head, because that's what these guys do. It, did they? they would collect everything and they'd sell, sell it for a very low price, and that would reimburse the debt. So she refused to do that. She called on her husband. The husband tried to uh, get the bailiff to leave. He was throwing rocks and bricks. Uh, the bailiff uh, uh, was afraid. He took out his gun and started shooting. He wounded uh, Lula Nolan's husband in the abdomen, which sort of like aroused the, the, the neighbors who came to the rescue to assist in pushing away the bailiff away from, from the neighborhood. Uh, he continued to fire around, but I think he didn't, he didn't uh, hurt anyone more than that. And uh, for the rest of the day, apparently there was hundreds and hundreds of people gathered around the neighborhood protesting uh, the invasion of their homes by uh, bailiffs, but also moneylenders and policemen. Right? So, so that's a typical uh, uh, sort of credit riot situation that you see a lot in the, in the archives in the early 19th, the 20th century. It's a time of very, very high racial tensions. There is, a, there is the, the Atlanta race riot, which is the worst episode of, uh, of racial hate probably in the history of the United States, with, uh, with a bunch of other massacres. But this one, this one was pretty, pretty rough in 1906, so this is shortly after. And um, what, what this says to me primarily is that we usually look at these loans in terms of interest rate, where we say, ah, OK, these poor people, they pay too much in terms of interest rate. So this is one part of the story, of course, but it's not the entire part of the story. I argue that if you look at these practices, so credit becomes some sort of prism through which you can observe a bunch of different, um, more structural phenomena, especially with relationship to, uh, with relation to uh, racial segregation, to the labor process, to the justice system. There's a whole bunch of things that get, that get sort of like intertwined when it comes to credit stuff. And it's not just about the price of credit in terms of interest rate. 
So, um, so one of the things we can say, so I'm going to talk about racial segregation, the labor process, and the justice system to kind of give you an idea of how this whole system works. So um, I said here, your word, when your word is not enough, but your work is, it kind of means that uh, you can't really, if you're trying to borrow, as a black person, if you're trying to borrow from a white entrepreneur, you can't just say, okay, I'll pay you later, right? You have to have some sort of collateral, and usually it was, it was the work, what I, what I already said. So. Uh, the first thing you have to understand is the, the, the cities in the south, we usually think of racial segregation as something that is, uh, that is sort of like sticks to the ghetto model because we have this idea of New York and Chicago where you had these huge ghettos, right? So you have a strict separation of races. In the southern cities, which I think is interesting from a historical standpoint, you, you didn't really have that model, right? You had different models of segregations. In, in some cities, the the former slaves were actually living really close to the, to, the, to the houses of their masters, their former masters, and so it stayed after uh, the, um, the abolition of slavery. So you had like black and white population were actually living in the same areas. It doesn't mean they would talk or they were less violent, but it just means that they were not separated. In Atlanta, it was a little bit similar in the sense that you didn't have a ghetto, but you had small pockets of um, African-American workers throughout the city, and this was done on purpose by the municipality who didn't want uh, the accumulation, they didn't want a ghetto because they were, they were afraid that this would lead to rioting and this would lead to uh, political concentration and a little bit too much agency. So they, they decided to isolate these communities from, from one another, right? And um, so this, you, know, you see these names have like really horrible names, <laughs> like Mechanicsville, Darktown, these things are just like, I mean, they don't exist anymore. Cabbage Town was where they would really, you know, used to grow the cabbage and everything. Um, and so companies in Atlanta were usually located in the city center at the, the, where the, the, the railroads were, and they operated offices in, um, in segregated neighborhoods. So, so this is something kind of new because we, we don't, it's very hard to understand that, that segregation doesn't lead to less exchanges, but it can actually lead to profit making. Like some people did actually profit of segregation. And why did I say that? It's because those, those African-American neighborhoods were very homogeneous. For instance, if you look at this, uh, these two neighborhoods called Mechanicsville and Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh is, is a city in the US that's very famous for its steel industry. Uh, it was called Pittsburgh because it has a lot of like, steel industries were located close by. Mechanicsville was the same. It, it had the, the railroad shops. Uh, here was a neighborhood that was really rich, one of the richest white neighborhoods called West End in Atlanta. And why I tell you so much about this is because the, the, the account book that I found um, with the names of the borrowers and everything, I realized that all the borrowers were living in a, a circle of like 1.5 kilometers around where the agency was located. So it means that these offices were providing uh, uh, money to people who lived really close by. Why? Because it was kind of hard to move around. It was probably more convenient this way. But also, from the point of view of the lender, if you settle an office really close to the factories, you have a higher chance of having these workers that you want to target, right? You want these stable workers, these industry workers, and so on. So in, uh, in the account book, you had actually two types of clients. You had uh, uh, one big type of client were uh, railroad workers, but the the most dominant type of client that you find, which is like 80% of the whole account book, was uh, African-American domestic workers. And uh, this was kind of a paradox to me because we always say like, uh, you know, like financial ex exclusion is usually, usually associated with women and with African-American minorities in the US. So that was kind of the opposite, right? In, in that account book, I had a, like a large overrepresentation of this population. So why is that? And um, actually the reason is that the, so most of these women actually worked for the white families that were close by. So it was very convenient for the white families to have these neighborhoods close by. And uh, what you have to understand is that at the time being a domestic worker was not a bad situation depending on where you were located in the hierarchy, right? If you were a janitor or a cook, obviously it was harder. But if you were a washerwoman, it was usually older women with a higher status because you required uh, tools, you, you need some stuff to actually perform the work, and you could work from home, and you had a lot of like autonomy in your work, and so at the time you actually had trade unions of domestic workers, like things we tend to forget now. Uh, they, they went on strike for minimum wage, and all these things that happened really early, even in the late 19th century. So um, what, uh, bottom line is, 
those women actually had way more stable jobs than the African-American men. Why? Because the men had to uh, go and work for big companies where they were facing the competition of their, the, uh, the white men, you know? And so they couldn't go into trade unions. They couldn't get the same contracts. They had to move around a lot. Sometimes they'd get into prison. Sometimes they'd be kidnapped and be forced uh, to work on certain, you know, uh, on certain um, construction. Like most of the roads in the South were built by prisoners. Uh, at the time with, through a system called convict leasing. So, so it, what, what it says is that men were at risk of having less stable jobs. Where that was not the case for, for these particular categories of African-American women who, uh, who usually had very stable jobs and could, could actually arbitrate between different types of families. If, if the white family didn't treat them well, they could move to a different type of family. It's not to exaggerate or idealize the positions, but it's just to say there was some sort of leeway which made them attractive to to the lender. So this is, this is a map that actually shows the collection uh, route of one of the collection agents I was working for his company. And so he goes, uh, well, in, the, in a very small area and he collects money every week, usually, uh, usually from the same, uh, same debtors. Uh, so, the, so this is how it collects to racial segregation. How does it collect to labor? Well, it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty obvious in the sense that uh, debt collection was adjusted to the rhythm of paydays. Why? Because when people got paid, uh, this is the moment that you had to you know, go to the, to the door of the person and ask for money. It was not a week later because then they wouldn't have any money. That was the, the idea of the collection agents, right? So for instance, uh, the washerwoman would wash the clothes during the weekend and the collection agent would come on the Monday. Why? Because they had just received, they had just given them the clothes and received the money back. So this is why they actually had cash in hand. That cash was really rare at the time. So they actually had dollars. In their, in their pockets. Um, and I found another example, which is not in Atlanta, but in the, the, the state next door, which is Alabama. Um, and it's through a, a piece of archive that was a testimony given by one collection agent whose job was to collect money. So he basically told the story of what his job consisted in. And so he said that uh, that, w that was the biggest uh, steel factory in, uh, in Birmingham, Alabama, which is one of the biggest uh, steel industry center uh, at the time. And he said that every Wednesday when there were pays day, you would see often collectors in line waiting as high as four at a time to see one worker. So it meant basically that the people had gotten their money from the payroll department. They got out of the factory and here were lines of collection agents just waiting to collect the money. And so the people would give $1 to this guy and $1 to the other guy and so on. So this is how it worked, right? Uh, why did it work like that? It was not only because it was convenient for the lenders to actually go and be at payday. It was, it was some sort of like pressure that they were exercising on, the, on this workforce. Why? Because it was right outside the factory, right? And if you don't pay, the workers really knew exactly what was going to happen. The lender was going to send this slip of paper that you saw earlier to the employer. If the employer became aware that especially an African-American worker had secured debt. It was already a bad thing, but on top of that, if he hadn't paid his debt, that could actually lead to really bad consequences, especially to, uh, to dismissal. Like, like employers would really frequently fire people who were into debt, right? And so, so paying on time and, and being a good borrower was a way to protect one's job. And you could see that in the, in when the, the, the collection agent says, you know, everybody knows that so long as he pays the interest on his money, the assignment uh, will never be turned over to his employer for payment. So everybody, this was a sort of a mutual understanding. So the lenders took advantage of that unequal labor process to make sure to force people to obligate them to pay back. Um, but this was, also, this was so made possible because of that, but it was also, um, it was also, uh, I mean, the, the, the most important thing was probably the justice system, <laughs> which was, uh, which if you don't study the justice system, usually you don't understand most of the things that are happening regarding like working class inequalities and so on. Like, there's a lot of stuff. There's the police violence stuff, which is like, uh, but there's also like more like day to day, like economic violence type of stuff that we, we start like understanding a lot of. Um, in sociology recently, you probably heard of the book uh, Eviction by Matthew Desmond. Uh, who looks at eviction courts in the United States. If you don't, I really invite you to, it won the Pulitzer Prize a couple years ago, but it's a really, it's a good like Christmas uh, read. <laughs> and, um, and this is a colleague of mine who worked on similar things. So the, the idea are very similar in the sense that um, uh, the, the, credit system, the, the creditors, the lenders would resort very heavily on the courts. 
right? So uh, they use these threats, like going to the factory, going to the door of the person. But these, if these threats didn't work, they could always go to the judge and present these slips of paper and ask for repayment, right? And so uh, on this map, I just put the, the circles that you see here are the courts in Atlanta at the time. So what, what is very obvious is that none of those courts were located in an African-American neighborhood, right? They were located in the city center, in white areas, or at the periphery. So what, what that means is that it was very, very complicated for the people to actually go to the trial if they were facing some sort of litigation. Most of the time, they even received a letter, and Desmond observed the same thing in the kind of, in the, in the, with contemporary eviction procedures, like most people don't even know they have a trial, right? And if they do know, if they receive the letter, then they probably cannot go to the trial because they have to work, or at the time, because if you want to go from this area to a, a, a court which is over there, you have very strict segregation, right? You can't, like, you, maybe you can take the bus, but it's hard, I and mean, it's complicated. So uh, lenders actually knew that, right? So they used this sort of seg like segregation of the justice system to make sure that it was very easy for them to collect the money. Of all the trials that I've looked into, of all the cases, everything, I never see one borrower who actually signed. <laughs> so it basically means that uh, none of them were actually present the day of the trial, right? None of them, it's like 0%. And um, so this is probably due to the, like, the ge geographic uh, configuration of justice, but not only that, like lenders, I can show that actually lenders knew which judges were more fav favorable to their causes, right? So some of the, some of the judges were actual, like none of, not all of the judges were actual like legal magistrates. Some of them were elected and so on. So they didn't have really a nice understanding of the law at the time. And uh, they were mostly like uh, white rich capitalists. So, and the lenders knew exactly which one they could go to. Like some of the guys would be old Southern paternalistic judges and be like, no, like, um, you can't ask for that much money from these, from these poor uh, black people. So they had this sort of like idea of the protective uh, white man, which goes back to the plantation era. And the, gen the lenders avoided these people, right? They, they would go rather to some other judges who knew were more like, yeah, I don't care about this. Let me, let me sign those papers. And there's, inst there's like funny instances, right? Because uh, those judges were very, very proud of adjudicating in a fast and routinized way, where some of the guys would go in the, in the newspaper and say, today I, I handled 300 cases in one day. You know, they were really proud of that, right? So 300 cases in one day is like, I don't know, but it's a lot, like it's like almost one every, because they didn't sit during the whole day, so it's probably one every three minutes or something like that. So you can imagine that you don't really have time to go to the interest rates and sort of compute the whole thing, right? You just sign and, and lenders would bring this in bulk, so they would present like a pile of paper like this, and the judge would just sign them off, and this is how it worked, basically. Like, and this is not, I, I studied Atlanta as a case study, but this is something that's way more general, actually. Um, okay, so this is what I call making people pay. It's not about like psychological pressure, it's also about like institutional uh, inequalities. Uh, okay, so moving on, I now jump to the second case study, which is on, on Chicago, on Illinois in general, but more specifically on Chicago. So here I used a different uh, type of data. I, through the, 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 the archives of the Household Finance Corporation, I was able to build a small data set, but still, it's still interesting, of 600 loan transactions that were um, uh, authorized by the company in 1916. So it's a little bit later than what we just studied, but it's the same time frame. And so in this data set, I have the amount of the loan, the occupation of the borrowers, and also the reasons they gave for borrowing. So that, this is the interesting part. Like, to actually, like people had to fill in why they applied for a loan. We never know if it's true or not. Like maybe they would say something that would look good on paper, but then they would use the money to drink and, and, uh, and gamble, which is the thing that reformers have like, in, in, the, in their head at the time, that poor people only use money for, for drug prostitution and alcohol. Uh, and, uh, but if you look at the, at the reasons for borrowing, this is not really what you see. Um, so this I can skip. Yeah, the, in Chicago, they would, they would respect the legal procedures more, like it was not as obvious and as outrageous as in the case of Atlanta, where it was just a sudden jungle and you know, it had no rules. It was a little bit more formal. But it's an interesting thing because we always, when we do history, we always tend to think that, you know, at some point, transactions become anonymous and market exchange starts happening and then 
you know, like formalization start happening and contracts start existing and stuff like that. This is something that we usually teach students as in like, they, they, uh, I don't know, with the mass credit at some point there was some sort of like formalization, face-to-face uh, -face exchanges didn't exist anymore and so on and so forth, right? And actually if you look at the like, stuff, it's really messy. Like you can't really say, like there's no moment in time where you can actually say this is modern consumer society or whatever, right? There are some things that still are from the past and then and, uh, and, and, and it's very different from one, one state to another, so it's very hard to draw general conclusions about all this. So uh, the first result that I can take from these databases is that all classes were represented in that, in that database, right? From, from doctors to, to street musicians to uh, peddlers, like people who sold stuff on the street, uh, industry workers, domestic workers, you had everyone, right? So, so the idea that um, this type of credit was restricted to the underclass, like to people who are very, very poor, is actually very modern because at the time, this was not the case. It was uh, uh, lenders who provided a service to a whole range of, of, uh, of individuals. What, so what I did here um, is I compared the distribution of, um, of occupations in that database with the distribution of occupation in a sample of the Illinois census, right? So I just compared the, the, how many of them were in the, sem in the, in the uh, census sample at the time with, with the distribution of, of, uh, of, uh, of occupations. That's probably more clear than, this is the, usually when I lose socio like sociology students, but it's probably why I get you back. So, uh, so this allows me to, to analyze the over or under representation of certain categories of occupation, right? So the most, overrepresented occupation were the, the railroad workers. So it's the second line here, you can see skilled and semi-skilled workers, 6.8% uh, in the database and only 2% in the, in the census sample. So it's almost like three times higher in our database. So this is not surprising, it's the same kind of result than in the South. Uh, railroad industries were uh, secured by the federal government, so for these lenders it was actually a very stable job and they focused not on laborers, so, so unskilled labor, right, but they focused more on foremen and uh, skilled uh, industry workers, right, so, so it's, a, it's, a, it's the same sort of result as in the South, right, because I already said that the, the, among domestic workers, for instance, only the upper segment of the domestic workers were high, highly overrepresented, so in a, in a different setting, this is, more, so this is, this is before the Great Migration, so there's basically no African American in Chicago at the time. There, are, there is migration, but mostly from Europe, uh, uh, Eastern Europe in particular. You, you, you still find the same sort of result. Uh, so you can see here, for instance, the foremen and overseers. So these are the les contremaîtres en français, like the, the, the higher workers are also very uh, highly represented. And, uh, and then among the, a lot of the overrepresented people, you have, um, people who, who didn't work for a salary, but were uh, people who had their own business. And because of their business, they had, they had furniture and capital that could also be seized in case of default. So we have like saloon owners or restaurant operators, people like this who had tables and chairs and, and pots and pans that if they didn't pay, the, the person could go there and actually seize everything. So I have a few nice examples in the, in the book where, for instance, like, uh, because they had to provide a list of the goods you know, they had in case of, of default, right? So through that, you can actually see what these people actually have like in their, in their possession. So there's a nice case of a, of a guy that owns a pool table, like a pool saloon, but it's also a sort of a barber shop. And he kind of lists all the things that he had on the, up until the, the barber poles, you know, the thing that, the, the stripy thing. So he, he would go again and like, and pledge that. So it is like a list of two pages of all the things that he owns, the cues and the balls and everything. And this is all provided to, uh, to, give the impression to the lender that you are a good risk, right? Because you have possession. And um, one of the most, the last thing was, um, is the same idea, but it's, it's interesting just as a historical phenomenon where the most highly represented category of workers were actually these here, which were rumors, rumors and borders, which probably doesn't ring any bell to you, but uh, it's, a, it's a very common type of activity at the time. It's actually people who owned houses and rented these houses to workers. So most of the people didn't have their own house and they didn't even like rent a proper apartment. They had temporary uh, rooms that they would live into with other workers and it was more convenient this way. 
it was what in Paris we had the hotel particulier, which was a, a little bit similar, right? And so these people, of course, were also good risks because they received rent every month from their from their tenants, right? And they also had furniture in the rooms and everything. So this is not surprising. It was mostly women who did this job. So again, you have this sort of like class and gender produce really interesting th stuff when it comes to credit. It's not only a question of exclusion. You have you have more like intersectional stuff that plays into the into the whole thing. But it's a uh, it's it's uh, it's interesting. Um, so the second big result I wanted to put here was regards not the occupations but the reasons for borrowing. So to understand what is interesting about this is the so uh, uh, there's this common idea at the time that, as I said, workers use credit to because they gamble and because they they drink alcohol and they go to prostitutes, right? And so most of the reformers of the time. But also the reformers of today, like Elizabeth Warren and all these guys, they, only, they always say, no, people don't uh, get credit because they are bad, unthrifty, immoral people. They get credit because they have life accidents. And this is the most like, overwhelming narrative that you always find. They, get, they resort to credit because they don't have a job, because they have a disease, because they lost their wife. Like really, like terrible stuff happened to them because they are, they are in a bad economic situation, and so this is why they get access to credit. And this is partly true, but also partly very wrong. Like in the sense that I understand why these people say that it's to 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 kind of uh, show a better light, you know, on the working class. But it's also historically wrong in the sense that people didn't necessarily resort to credit because they had terrible experiences, right? And this goes back to a larger question in sociology and economics, which is. Uh, how do consumers perceive the future, right? Do they make decisions in the very present? Do they make decisions in the long run? And you have all these discussions about the discount factor in, in economics and do, like, do poor people actually have a discount factor because they're so in the present that they, they can't even think about the future? And actually, historically speaking, this is all kind of also wrong in the sense that uh, the working class was getting credit because they had bad situations, but it was not only that, right? So uh, I categorize the, the, the reasons of borrowing. And this is just like one counter example, but it, it tells a lot. Like I, I, I categorize the reasons for borrowing into three major categories on the left side here. So what I call pressing expenses. So this is what we usually associate with the working class credit, right? So it's like uh, dismissal, you've been fired, illness, death, an unexpected commercial or professional setback, like someone stole your your, you had a robbery in your shop and someone stole everything you had. Uh, debt recollection, like someone coming to perceive your salary. This is all what I call like pressing experiences, which is like unexpected events that sort of uh, completely, like, uh, uh, completely destabilize your, your own private economy, right? So you had, uh, this was 40% of the loans, basically. So it's important, but it's still only for 40%. Um, the, the second category are what I call budget adjustments. So these are not like pressing expenses. They're just day-to-day -day operations. So you either had to buy coal for, for heat. You had to buy uh, uh, clothing. You had to buy medicine. But this is not something that you can really tie to an un unexpected uh, situation, right? So these uh, consumers were consumers, right? They were not just driven by uh, life events that you know would drive them around like, like uh, I don't know, like they would just... Uh, that baseline is they had some sort of agency, so they, they would uh, use consumption goods, they would adjust their credit. There's a lot of, uh, of reasons that actually say like to keep, keep good credit or to uh, concentrate my debt, like stuff like that, that sort of indicate an idea of like uh, economic management of one's own budget. Then you had uh, pay, paying bills, rent and taxes, like uh, shit like that. Like for instance, someone had to like to you could pay you could use money to pay rent because you 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 some some people were facing eviction procedures so this was really pressing of course like you had to get some money to pay your rent otherwise you would lose your home some other people uh, just borrowed because they needed a little bit of money but it was not nothing too too strict and the last uh, category is investments and so some people actually looked into the future and had specific projects that they use these credits for uh, so i have some uh, funny examples um, i had one or two here like for instance 
one uh, railway mechanic, so like a, really a factory worker, borrowed fifty dollars to buy a small candy and potion store. So really wanted to open his own business. Apparently, another guy, which is a similar story, an engine inspector, so also a factory worker, uh, who wanted to open a motion picture show. So he borrowed a uh, hundred dollars to uh, open a cinema at the time, right? So. Probably, of course, this was not, you know, he needed more than $100 to, to open a motion picture show, but it was probably like either a, a down payment that he could use to, 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 you know, to leverage some other credit from either the bank or something else, right? So there's a strong interconnection between all these types of credit, right? So it's very easy to say like these credits are immoral, they need to be uh, did, like, done away with, like we need to get rid of these creditors like the Obama administration did, but people tend to forget that these systems of credit are very interconnected, right? You, you, you get a little bit of money to pay on your house, and then you use your house to actually build other credit to, to secure other goods and those sorts of things. Right? So you, you have to have this complex vision of what's happening, otherwise you don't understand really uh, how this system works. And so uh, these investment uh, uh, loans were obviously more uh, taken by higher classes, so people who had higher jobs than, 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 than the lower segments. I show that in different uh, things, but they were still not uncommon for even the poorest of the, of the consumers. Okay, so this is kind of all I wanted to say about the, the credit system in general, and so I'm moving to my, um, to my second section, which uh, will be much shorter, but, uh, but talks about how uh, this system was regulated, because from the very beginning, from like the early 20th century, and this is more the, the, the paper that I, that I sent out, you had uh, political movements that were carried in the country to say that this was bad. <laughs> Basically, that this was the worst thing that ever happened to the American working class, and that the, they needed some sort of reform. So uh, between um, 1903 and 1917, you had 102 crusades that I was able to locate. So these people call themselves crusaders, where I, like a, Crusaders of credit. I mean, like uh, I'm going to carry this sort of mission to to reform the system and uh, and build a really good credit system. So most big U.S. cities had actually some sort of episode of the of the um, of crusades. So a little bit of of background to understand why this happened at the time. So this is just before the New Deal, right? This is like 10 years before the New Deal. At the time, the federal government had no intention to intervene in the economy. The federal government was basically like an empty nutshell, and uh, all the decisions were made by huge corporations such as the, the Rockefeller and the Carnegie and everything, right? So um, there was not a lot of, of happening in terms of like economic policies. They <laughs> didn't really exist. And uh, anyway, so uh, a lot of local elites, when I mean elites, is like businessmen, philanthropists, uh, church leaders, um, all these sort of people like at the level of cities, uh, started carrying uh, social reforms, right? Uh, so it was in the realm of credit, but it also happened in the realm of prostitution, in, in the realm of uh, medicine, like a whole bunch of social reforms were actually carried by elites at the city level. And why is that? It's because precisely the federal government would not do anything when it, when it came to social intervention. And it more actually, it's more interesting than this because most of these guys were actually uh, um, uh, were credit activists at the time, most of them were opposed to the intervention of the federal government, right? They really believed, you know, they were strictly Republican and so on, and they believed that the government should not interfere with the economy, but themselves, as enlightened elite, could still push for social reform at the local level, because that would make good citizens, you know, who would not fall into uh, uh, these bad habits of uh, alcohol and gambling and everything, right? So uh, the way to create a good citizen was to have local programs of reform that would also prevent the federal government from needing to even intervene so much. Uh, so this is sort of the context that why these, these movements appeared and were so strong, right? And um, so they did a, a whole bunch of things. They, they um, would wage really big attacks in the press against the lenders. They would uh, seek out victims so that they could land, launch prosecutions. So they actually went to court for the borrowers. So if the borrower would contact one of these guys and they would accompany them through courts and sort of like face the lender. Uh, so you had this sort of like legal assistance kind of thing, which is something that is very new at the time, what we call today legal aid, which is very common in, in the US. Uh, it sort of starts at that time and credit is a very important aspect of their work, which is like preventing the fact that people get, uh, get harassed by the justice system. Um, 
And they also sometimes created other credit companies to sort of provide a market alternative to the thing, but it never really worked out. And so um, the, the, the credit reform that they pushed for was a state credit reform. So at the time, the, the relevant law, which is the thing that I mentioned in the paper, is not the federal law, but it's the state law. Why? Because states in the US, as you know, have a lot of power. Uh, they have a lot of prerogatives, and one of their main prerogatives in terms of economic policy is to define interest caps when it comes to consumer loans. Right? This is not defined at the federal level. It is now a little bit, but at the time, it was the prerogative of states. So these reformers, if they wanted to change something and actually create a better market, they had to uh, conduct their, their, their struggle at the state level. So uh, this all led to one of the largest like, credit reforms of the century because uh, between 1917 and 1934, 28 states passed uh, what they call a uniform small loan law, which was a law deemed at reforming uh, small credit. And so this, this sort of created the first consumer credit market at the national level. We all, I think all of us, even me before I did my, my dissertation, we all kind of associate consumer credit with the New Deal Right, because Roosevelt had all these policies like Keynesian policy with um, uh, credit stimulation and so on. But the first really national credit level when it comes to, to policy making and regulation actually dates back from this era. Right? So it, it overlaps with the New Deal a little bit, but it was, it was way before. And so the, what they put in place was uh, they authorized these lenders to uh, fix a higher interest rate of 3.5% monthly, which is quite high. Right? It's like 42% annually. When it comes to usury rates, this is really high. Yeah, usually, usury rates are like 8 or 9% annual. This was 42% annual. So they authorized these higher rates, saying that because this is for small loans, so loans that are under $300, uh, the lenders could still make a profit without having to ask for really, really high loans like the loan sharks would, would fix. The, so loan sharks would, would ask for like 100%, 200% loan price. So they said, OK, let's, let's authorize a slightly higher rate and this will allow these companies to make a little profit, but still like, have some sort of, of fair uh, rate for the borrowers. Um, and so what I, what I want to emphasize through this is that um, this produced some sort of a, of a segmentation of credit. Why? Because um, the, the companies who started making these regulated loans didn't give money to the same type of people that the loan sharks would provide money to to begin it. Why? Because the 3.5% monthly rate was still too low to give money to the very, very poor classes of the population. So, and also because of a lot of things that I'm going to touch to right now, but it's basically because of these reforms, this created a regulated market, but it also created an unregulated market. So the people who could not access this sort of credit, because this, this type of regulated credit was mostly um, uh, uh, for, let's say, like lower middle class, like white men. That's basically who had access to this sort of credit. So as they were regulating the, cre the, the market, they, was all, they were also segmentating it. And this is, this is something that I find quite fascinating because uh, you, it's the, like, like hell is paved with like, bad, like good intentions, as we all know. So this, this, this is this sort of story, right? They, they thought they were doing really something great, but actually, when you look into the detail, um, it sort of created something kind of strange that had lasting consequences. And so there's one sociologist, American sociologist, who, who recently wrote a paper to say that uh, there was something as the constitutive rightness of credit that we always assume that you know, cre credit is something for the whites. And this is something that I find it, is very, very relevant to to the case that I'm studying. So really quickly, I'm going to go through the, the way this problem was, was, was created and why, why did it lead to such a segmentation, right? So for instance, in Georgia, where the, the, the case that we talked about recently, um, this is the way that reformers spoke of credit issues in the time, right? So for them, it was basically a threat to the white economy. So even though these, these lenders would provide money to both types of to, to, to white and African-American borrowers. This is how the grand jury of Atlanta uh, uh, shaped the problem. So they said uh, that credit affects the supply of female servants and many housewives, so, so white ladies, uh, housewives, mistresses of the, of the most exclusive circles. So this is like rich people. 
uh, will do all in their power to correct the present condition of affairs, which is terrible, which makes the keeping of servants compared to past epochs practically an impossibility. So if you read between the lines, what does it say? Is that during slavery, it was much easier to keep the servants. But now, now that they have freedom of mobility and that there's a labor market for domestic services, it's, very, it's harder to, for the white families to keep the servants, right? And so they're accusing the creditors of creating shortages of female servants. Why? Because uh, they are accusing the creditors that, for instance, if someone doesn't pay their debt and is into debt, they move away from the city because they want to avoid the trial and, and you know, stuff like that. Or they, they lose their, their money and they go to prison and all these things. So basically, they, they only saw this credit issue through the lens of how it affected the white domestic economy, which I think is, is quite interesting because they, they turn it around, right? It's like, yes, it is for African-American borrowers, but we're going to make it about the white economy. And the second thing they say is that it usually like it diverts money away from the white credit circuits. So it says like for instance, the small retail houses, so like um, le commerce de détail en français, like small small shops, uh, would be accusing these lenders of uh, getting money away from them because uh, their clients wouldn't be able to pay their bills because they owed so much money to the loan sharks and so on. So this is all like partially true, but also kind of wrong. And it's all about how they shape the issue. So this is what they had in mind. Um, so uh, another interesting case to kind of like give a counterpart to what I just did was the way the problem was uh, framed in New York. Like if you, probably if you consider every state had a different history, but this is very representative of how they, how they thought about this issue. So in the South, it was like racial stuff, but it was mostly about the white. In, in New York, it was a little bit different. And um, uh, they had this idea that the loan shark was a threat basically to the white breadwinner. And so um, I have this quote from one of the leading guys at the time who basically said, like, uh, once infected with the borrowing germ, a man will often borrow from every possible source till at last he gets into deep water, his family suffering as a result of his transactions, and he himself becoming a veritable slave with his entire earning capacity mortgage for months to come to the loan sharks. Right? So they, this is what they had in mind. Of course, they used the metaphor of slavery, which is very violent for us to, to read, but it's, this is what they thought about these things, right? So they. They, they make this equivalence and, and so basically they had the idea that this was men, hardworking men, who because of the loan sharks could not provide for their families. That's what they had in mind. Right? So I, make, I, I have a little uh, clip that, uh, I don't know if I have time to show it. Like, uh, yeah. So uh, it's only two minutes, but it was a movie that was made at the time. It got recently uh, reshaped and I just want to show you like two minutes. This is a silent movie so I can talk <laughs> in the meantime. And it was actually a really, even if it's only 16 minutes, I'm not going to show it. I'm just going to show two minutes. But still, this is something that required a lot of money at the time. This is not like a low budget thing. This was the Thomas Edison company. It was the largest company of the time. They had to put a lot of money in the production of this thing. And uh, so it's, it's quite interesting. It's not something. Uh... So if that works. That's a little bit before. Yeah, there we go. So uh, it starts with uh, a typically, as you can see, like middle class family who just had a baby, you can see. And uh, the mother, they have financial issues. And so the mother says, OK, we should, we should mortgage this, this piece of uh, ring that the, the, that the kid has. And then the father is like, no, 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 we don't have to go through that expense. I'll, I'll just get the money from my friend. And uh, so this is the loan shark, how it actually looks. So you have this typical. Uh, super masculine, uh, uh, sort of like gang guy, cigar and everything. So he, he basically forces the man to sort of sign the thing. He's like, yeah, I'm going to give you money, but, uh, but you know what's going to happen, right? So another payment is due. So the movie is called The Usurer's Grip. So it's really like how you, how you put the hold on this. So then the man leaves. Of course, the, man, the, the, the usurer comes back. Uh, and she, the wife is saying, thank you, of course. Sorry, it's very dull, but it's, I think for me it's fascinating to see how. And, um, and so there is some weird moment that you, you kind of think that, the, that she's into the creditor. So the idea that sort of the, 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 the lender, because he has so much power, is actually a sexual threat to the family because women were perceived as fragile creatures and whatever. And so you have this thing. So the, the man comes back in the, in the very end. 
And then uh, the last scene is actually the most interesting part. So you're going to see that uh, uh, the lender is going to send one of his collection agents, a woman, to the job of the man to sort of shout out that the guy didn't pay to his money. So this is the name of the collection agent. It's called the baller out, which didn't exist, <laughs> but they still thought it did exist. And so uh, she would go to the office of the man, so this typical office job, and she would humiliate him in front of all these coworkers, saying like, you got into debt and you didn't pay your money, blah, blah. And so, uh, and so then she drags, no, she's yelling at him. So, and she's an older woman, right? She's like kind of masculine, she has short hair. So they, you have this idea of like emasculation of the worker, right? Because he's deprived of his salary, he's deprived of his masculinity, is, uh, of, his, of his provider uh, status. Uh, and so she collects the money directly from the employer, the employer signs the assignment of wage, <coughs> wages, and the guy gets fired after. And so this is a circle of going down and down and down into debt. And uh, so this is the sort of idea. So it's a very miserabilistic account of working class credit. It's very at odds with what we just saw. Like, right, this was very different than <laughs> what we just uh, studied. This, uh, this almost never happened in that sense, right? And even if it did, it was very marginal in terms of, of uh, probability. Okay, so uh, this is what the Russell Sage Foundation pushed as like the main narrative, and they were very strong. So actually, this movie was saw, was saw a lot. It was spread around the country. Usually, you would you would show this movie before showing like um, uh, a, like typical movies of the time, like Dancing with the Wind and stuff like that. Like it was like a so it was it was actually seen. Uh, and so the the last thing, the sort of last thing that goes in the same direction was uh, in Illinois. Um, so the same sort of story in, in Illinois. The, they had a big problem that also didn't exist, but they, <laughs> it, it occupied a lot of their resources, what, what they called white slavery. So it, it's not the enslavement of white people. It's the, uh, the idea that some women, especially young women who moved from the countryside and were looking for jobs in Chicago, those who couldn't find a job had to go to like really bad employment agencies and were, and were sort of forced into prostitution. So you had this idea that uh, uh, fragile single women in this area were uh, kidnapped and forced into sex trafficking, right? So white slavery was actually a really big deal at the time. For 20 years, a lot of like, money and resources were spent on like, trying to reduce white slavery. And, uh, and this was something that never really existed. So it's kind of like, it's, I don't know, it seems kind of absurd. But uh, the loan shark actually came as a, as a counterpart to the white slavers. Why? Be why? Because uh, basically, women were at the mercy of sexual slavery, so these fragile women, and men were uh, at the mercy of financial slavery. So, and, and, and you have a lot of uh, reformers who fought on, on, on both fronts. They, they, they carried uh, crusades against white slavery and the loan sharks. These, these sort of parallel each other. One of the main leaders of the time was Jane Addams that you, you probably know. I don't know if you know her, but she's, like, she's the main voice uh, when it comes to prostitution at the time, and even today she's still very famous in the US, I guess, and seen as like a progressive figure, which I think is very surprising because of some of the things she said. And for instance, uh, she had this idea that loan sharks would drive a fragile women into prostitution. Why? Because some of the women who couldn't find jobs or who wanted to have amusements, like go to the movies or buy themselves sometimes clothes, they would run out of money and be forced to sell their body to pay back the debt, right? So they made the creditors responsible for these things that didn't exist. But that, that was kind of the story. That they, anyway, so um, I'm going to skip that. We can talk about this later. But it's, um, yeah, I think I'm just going to skip that. But it, it tends to, to show you. So this is more what I, I, I put in the paper was more of the, um, the sort of financial legal stuff you know, that go, that's going on with this. this. I wanted to present the more like cultural history that goes along with this. But the two are sort of intertwined, right? But, this tends to show how um, uh, these intent for reform led to this thing that I call the constitutive whiteness of credit, which is like uh, the idea behind all this is that first uh, 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 credit is for the white people, right? And and it's an issue of the and even if it concerns African American borrowers, it's because it affects indirectly the white economy, right? So that's the first uh, consequences. The second thing is that um, yeah, not, it's the fact that. Um, it's not, we always have this idea that poor people and minorities and whatever are bad risks because they don't pay their money or whatever. This is the, the standard economic thing, right? Like, like the less money you have, the higher the risk. 
empirically speaking, historically speaking, this is wrong. Like pay, poor people actually pay their money on time all the time, like way more than rich people. Like rich people spend their time trying to avoid paying their debt and their taxes, and everybody knows that. But still, in most models, like the risk is still uh, adjusted to take into account the fact that poor people are higher risk who don't pay their money. And what this says is that like the story is a little bit complicated. Like it's not a, it's not so much an economic risk as it is like some sort of reputational reputational risks for the lenders because uh, you have this idea that good credit is only for the rational consumers who know how who knows how to handle his finances, right? So if you lend money to people who are too fragile to know what to do with it, especially the minorities and women, then you are a bad creditor because you profit from the fragility of these categories of, of population. So this is the, the, the underlying thing that is behind the whole like bad risk tied to poor people. It's, it's not so much that they don't pay the, their debt because this is actually wrong. Most cases, it didn't go to the, to the magistrate that I showed earlier. Like most cases were actually paid on time because they know that the consequences are a lot more drastic if you are poor. But it's more of a, like this, this reputational thing that you know like uh, like uh, you can't profit of these, of these people. And because they are not rational consumers, then you can't really lend them money. And this is a very perversive thing, right? You, you see it in the US, but you see it also in the developing world, like with those, this discussion about microcredits and now with FinTech, you know, all these like small credits that go through cell phones and everything. And it's the same discussions that go and the same arguments that keep being repeated and repeated and repeated. And the thing is that most of the time we actually have no data on, on why these loans are used uh, who are the people behind those things? Who are the creditors? Like people go, don't go to that extent, and yet they still have very mo moralistic discourses about the working class in, in, in general. And this is true for both the U.S., Europe, and uh, and uh, and developing countries. I think I'm stopped there. I can come back to other stuff uh, during the discussion. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, today we will be presenting um, a commentary on uh, turning wages into capital. Uh, broadly speaking, the paper provides a, a historical narrative of how access to credit um, through wages was contested among various groups in the US in the early uh, 20th century. Um, in this, present in this pre presentation, rather than um, prov provide a detailed summary of the paper, we will take a, um, talk a bit about um, some of the related topics and try to link the paper to contemporary issues um, and economic theory. Um, so this is just an outline of the paper. Um, I will start off by speaking a bit about um, what turning wages into capital um, 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 refers to in the paper. Um, thereafter, the process of capitalization will be uh, explained and applied uh, in two examples, housing and data. Um, I will first introduce the concept of turning housing into capital, into capital and then Jordi will explain the concept of turning data into capital. Um, and then in the second component of the presentation, uh, Luca will talk a bit about the French regulation, school and social structure of accumulation, um, weaving the different um, aspects of the paper and the presentation together. Okay, so uh, I will now talk about the concept of turning wages into capital. Um, so in the paper, it explains the unsecured loans um, to consumers. Uh, it, 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 it explains that um, unsecured loans to consumers are not devoid of collateral, but rely on future uh, revenues as security as opposed to material uh, properties such as uh, goods, furniture, houses, and then tracing back the history of, of credit scores over time. Um, in the 19th century, labor income in the form of wages or salaries became secure enough for workers to enable access to credit on the sole basis of um, the occupation. Uh, so the reliance on wages um, to access credit required a legal coding of labor income into capital. Uh, basically, uh, the argument is that, in, in the papers, that turning future virtual wages into capital was not the result of industrial, technological, or cultural evolutions but the outcome of a long-term legal and political process involving conflicts between companies and progressive movements. Um, turning wages into capital, of course, requires an understanding of wages itself. And um, from a Marxist perspective, wages are an ongoing um, 
advance contracted by the employer over the current month or week, only to be reimbursed uh, at the end of the production cycle. Creating and building a market for wage credit would have required a form of brokerage where companies would uh, temporarily liquidate their employer's debts. Um, though an advance given to the work in exchange for a fraction of the um, amount lent. Um, and then uh, I will now talk about, about um, capitalization and related to housing. So accommodation or cost of shelter make up a significant uh, proportion of the cost of living. Uh, wages are uh, contributed to the purchasing of the house, the increasing financialization and um, rentierization um, in the housing market ever means that another transformation can be made specifically uh, the turning of, cap of housing into capital. So even though the paper does not um, directly deal with capital in the form of housing, um, the relationship between wages and housing prices is an important one to unpack in light of the context of the housing and affordability crisis. Uh, from a sociological perspective, um, capitalization is part of an epistemology uh, whereby value is observed as a result of a process. Uh, Munisa uh, study capital um, not as something that one owns or does not have, but as a method of control, a configuration, um, or an operation. Uh, from this perspective, the sociologist's gaze is not on value, but on the legal and regulatory compliance as central mechanisms in shaping financial markets. It nonetheless provides a useful avenue to, um, to the concept of renturization. So renturization, according to uh, Ryan Collins, is um, um, encompass, encompasses financialization, but also goes beyond that um, by incorporating fiscal and financial policy and coordination. Um, essentially, it is about uh, the broad shift in policy towards the treatment of housing as a form of economic rent extraction. Um, and then as a result of liberalization in the 1980s, mortgage credits um, expanded at a much faster rate than income and growth, driving up house prices. Um, the following figure shows the house price to income ratio index for 17 developed countries. And from the 1990s and 2000s, central banks and governments encouraged the emergence of large markets for residential backed mortgage securitization, which enabled pension funds and other institutional investors to enter mortgage markets, enabling banks to generate new sources of profit from packing up and selling on, on these securities. Um, this enabled further mortgage credit expansion and later contributed to the 2007-2008 um, global financial crisis. Um, the policies prior to the global financial crisis increased housing's attractiveness as a financial asset as opposed to bonds or equities. And then uh, between the 1990s to 2000s, um, economies were given homeowners and landlords increasingly generous um, tax breaks on primary and secondary home ownership, including tax relief on capital gains and mortgage interest payments. Uh, so there's no doubt that low interest rates encourage borrowing, um, but they should be thought of as a necessary but not sufficient condition to explain the transformation of housing into a financial asset. Um, the sufficient condition is a liberalized financial sector um, and a policy framework that, that systematically favors landed property, both as a form of tenure and as a financial asset. Uh, this policy framework would need to be supported by legal protection too. So Pistor's um, concept of legal coding, as mentioned in the paper, um, could also be, s be seen relevant in understanding the, the turning of housing into capital. Um, so ultimately, there needs to be a reframing away from renturization to housing being viewed as what is uh, to what it is in its first instance, uh, which is the place of shelter. I will now be handing over to Jordi, who will provide an another example of um, capitalization. Perfect. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for your nice presentation. And not only that, but also for talking about fintech at the end, because <laughs> it's the relation that I did too, and it's great <laughs> that you uh, introduced it, let's say. So uh, what I'm going to talk is about the financial inclusion. Financial inclusion, basically what is, is let's say, the marketing term that they give, gave to uh, microfinance, uh, after microfinance pretty much failed in its own terms. <coughs> and, but I, I'm trying to think about two uh, main ideas of the 
of, of your paper. Uh, one is that credit relations need a way of pricing the future, uh, collateral and a legal framework. I'm focusing on uh, a way of pricing the future and collateral, and I think that data, to some extent, provides for that. Provides in the sense that it's a, a way to, to measure cre credit risk assessment. And, of course, it's not collateral, but it's a way of providing sec security, which is, at the end, what collateral is for, uh, providing security for the lender. <coughs> and also, uh, what I want to treat is how digitalization plays a role that industrial jobs, uh, stable industrial jobs, uh, play in your, uh, in your paper in promoting this unsecured lending. So, uh, just focusing on one of the statements that resonated with me of this paper, is uh, about the importance of, of, of looking at the interplay no, of legal, political, and relational factors. And is, I, I think it's something that I, for sure, as an economist, and I think also a lot of other economists do uh, when trying to understand our current reality. And that's why I will try <laughs> with my limited <laughs> knowledge to do. And for that, OK, let's look what the Al uh, Alliance for Financial Inclusion is. And <laughs> it's a, a, a weird monster, let's say. So the founders is the, are part of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Omidia Network. Uh, Omidia Network, uh, Omidia is basically the guy uh, behind eBay. There are 90, I think, countries uh, from the Americas, Africa, and Asia, and uh, BBVA, MasterCard, or Visa. Uh, with which other type of enterprises do, uh, this, does this alliance uh, I interact? And these are Revolution Credit and Signify. Basically, what they do is, for example, le le let's take the case of Signify, what we have in a lot of countries, people that don't have a bank, so, uh, a, a bank account. Therefore, it's really difficult to, to extract any, any data from them. But there is uh, what it's called di di a digital footprint, meaning people have a mobile phone. So <laughs> it's really dra draconian to some extent. What Signify does is just by taking uh, uh, texts and, and calls uh, tracks, they create a behavioral data assessment with which they <laughs> create this credit risk assessment. Uh, <coughs> Revolution Credit, what it does, it creates some online games <laughs> uh, through which, uh, by the decisions taken with the individuals which are potential borrowers, they create also behavioral tracks. So we see how uh, here uh, <laughs> this data is really important to open a space uh, for high profit investment, basically, for, for financial firms. And Half of the countries within the alliance find the Maya Declaration, which basically uh, summarizing, uh, recognizes the importance for, for financial inclusion as a dev developmental project. So there are some broad demands uh, made to the states, so microfinance. Basically what said is, okay, states get out of the way, just they regulate. Now here, uh, being re really <laughs> simple, but here they're asking them to become players, uh, proactive players, which should provide uh, a, a technology, uh, financial education, uh, macroeconomic stability, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And very quickly, and that's my last slide. Uh, so I, I want to look at, at a, a, a specific example. This is the case for some India. So how is this process uh, and, and turning into this interplay of legal uh, political actors, what happens in India? In 2009, the, the Adhar project is created in which each citizen is given an identification number based on a biometric uh, identity. Then subsidies are given just to bank accounts. In 2016, a lot of things happen. One of the most important is that this Adhar number is uh, match, let's say, in a database with bank accounts and, and, and mobile phone accounts. Private entities are, 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 are allowed to use this, uh, this database without the consent of individuals. And then there's the monetization. So 86% of the currency is taken out of, of, of circulation by prohibiting 501,000 uh, banknotes. Finally, in 2017, businesses uh, are only uh, are obliged to pay workers through checks or, or electronic bank transfer. So, we've looked how uh, all of them interplay into, uh, and, and this importance of data, no, uh, in this great relation. But what I also want to uh, underline is how, in your case, we see okay, there is industrialization which gives wages, and then we have collateral, etc. But now here, the trend on which 
this place, which is digitalization, is enforced. So here what we see is the state is coercively obligating everyone <laughs> to uh, have a bank account, to have a mo because otherwise you just cannot do nothing. Uh, there's a complete, uh, so cashless society is uh, of light uh, uh, upon the people, let's say. And that's where I wanted to end. Okay, so um, basically, uh, I think, yeah, now you, you kind of got a grasp of what the point was of our presentation to kind of um, situate it more in our current um, times. And I think the, the examples from Ali and Jordi were quite nice in this regard. And I think especially like the example from Jordi in terms of the reverse redlining very much matches what you've been um, discussing in the beginning. And what I want to do for this final part is really like focus on the other part of the paper, um, namely the regulation. And um, But before doing so, I just wanted to um, yeah, <coughs> quickly introduce and somehow like pull all these strength together, um, uh, threats together um, with this um, quote from La Pavitas, um, because I think it's quite nice in terms of uh, illustrating the role of the workers um, in, in the context in text of debt, but also in terms of the present day um, financialization. So basically, I'm just going to read it out. Um, financialization means workers have been increasingly drawn into the realm of private finance to meet basic needs, including housing, consumption, education, health provision for old age. This has been an area era um, of unstable low growth, stagnant real wages and frequent financial bubbles. The need for alternative economic organization that is crisis free will d um, while deserving the interest um, while serving the interests um, of working people is apparent. So yeah, for me, this kind of quote puts back uh, into focus what we are talking about and why we are talking about and this and these conflicting um, forces also between wages uh, and stagnant well wages and on the other side the privatization of all these um, fundamental um, yeah elements like healthcare and so on and also what I wanted to take out from this quote is the notion of crisis and this is something that um, is going to lead me through the the rest of the presentation which um, is re very tightly um, connected also to the discussion of regulation which um, becomes apparent in this quote by Leibniz namely that crisis is just the opposite of regulation or regulation is the opposite of crisis um, and this is really the context um, from which the regulation school also develops out of this need to regulate um, crisis and capitalism uh, and to sort of put it on a track that it uh, will have longer lasting stability and, and growth also. And um, yeah, so famously the two elements of this are the, the discussion of the regulation regime and this for me was very interesting and nicely connected to the, uh, what you were doing on, in the paper. Um, which is na the the production and distribution of value and surplus, and this um, happens in the context of institu in an institutional framework, which is also um, illustrated in a very cultural context. So um, here, basically, the mode of regulation they rely on rules, norms, conventions, patterns of conduct social networks, organizational forms, and so on and so on. So yeah, a very wide um, understanding of institutional economics, I think. Um, and then, yeah, these five different forms of mode of regulation, which I think is not very interesting to go into right now. But um, basically where I want to go to now is to put these two modes together to obviously the mode of development which is the inherent notion of regulation school and this is um, basically to say that there is no continuum um, of 
yeah, a neg accumulation regime, but this is framed within this institutional context and then also by these class conflicts that um, which shape um, these regimes and also cause the rupture in the end and the notion of crisis that I was um, starting up. So, so to say there is no clear defined direction um, and it is very much um, a situation of power structure. Um, and yes, here yet another theoretical lens, the social structure of accumulation regime. And this is something um, which I took from a paper from Hein, because I think it figured it was quite nicely how they were complementing the two and the social structure of um, accumulation regime in that regard has very, uh, like a lot of things in common uh, with the uh, French regulation school, it is also focusing on this institutional element with the uh, um, power dynamics between capital and uh, labor. And yeah, so just another uh, quote from Hein here, the social structure of accumulation approach focuses on the ability of uh, capitalism to reinvent itself after the period of prolonged um, stagnation and or crisis. So in that regard, it just has a very similar notion. And um, obviously in your paper, you were very going much more in depth into the beginning of the 20th century um, or like the light, late 19th century until the Great Depression. Um, so this is a period that I <laughs> I feel like there's no need to, to discuss this anymore. And basically what I just wanted to do is use this framework to kind of illustrate what, um, yeah, my my co-presenters have been doing here. And it's really the, the context um, of the global neoliberal area and how we ended up here, which is again using this idea of raptures and therefore, um, yeah, that would be basically this block here, um, the third block, um, uh, which is obviously characterized by uh, a very, very strong union and very strong labor power. Um, also, the Keynesian regime in terms of welfare provision um, and all these different factors, which however then um, in, in the early um, 80s somehow are be um, fade away or there's different analysis of this. So for example, the social structure of accumulation regime is saying that this is the outcome of a process um, in which uh, there is a decrease in profitability because investment eventually goes down due to the um, high share of, uh, to, due to the power of um, workers and the high share of la um, wages, which obviously is something then also very discussed if you take a look at it from, for, for example, post-Keynesian terms, um, who would much more argue that um, this rupture is something that starts with a um, change in, in institutions. So, for example, uh, if you think about the um, decline of the Bretton Woods system and so on, which then, however, in eventually re leads to this rupture and brings us to this new area that they have then been um, illustrating in more in greater depth where there's um, a greater dominance of capital over labor and also you and very importantly you go into the separation of the financial from the non-financial sector and you have this whole discussion of to what degree is finance really related to our real world production or is it um, sort of being separate and Okay, so <laughs> this is obviously the part from your paper that I didn't want to go into. <laughs> I, I assume that you uh, <laughs> would spell that out more in depth and would, that would be more to illustrate the second part. But um, maybe just to conclude, um, so what I wanted to do here is to connect this quote by Gutmann with the first quote from Lapavitsas that I was using. Um, where he really pushes us to think 
beyond this notion of crisis and think how can we how can we change this and how can we lead to a more um, yeah stationary uh, and functional system that is um, serving sort of the needs that we need in the in terms of the real economy and um, Goodman here on the other hand is saying um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't. I don't want to say that he would in, uh, disagree. I think with um, Lavavitsas, but m really, um, it struck me in terms of that finance somehow is, or like relating, uh, regulating finance is fighting the last war. Um, if you do it in a way that you're always going back, only look what happened, what what went wrong. Th sort of throughout the 2007-2008 crisis and then wreck to that, try to implement the regulations, but you're not forward thinking and you're not thinking, okay, what are the needs that need to be addressed that um, La Favisas was referring to? So, um, and in that regard, I'm trying to conclude here very much this um, effort that we've been making to embed the, the nice methodological, but also theoretical framework in sort of like today's um, observation of uh, finance and maybe <laughs> yeah for, for the question like uh, regarding the qu first question um, I'm a little amused because I feel like you have been answering this question already in um, in your presentation to some degree since for when we were reading the paper we were sort of struggling to connect it a little bit to today, uh, to the present time. This is also why our contribution has been focusing so much on that. But I feel like, since you basically kicked off with also uh, Alia's contribution about 2008, this is obviously different. But still, I want to raise this point. Um, what do you think um, your historical analysis analysis can give us um, in terms of guidance or comprehension of the current power struggles, and also in terms of informing informing us. Um, how we can take political action and how these um, union forces can still be forces or um, forms of organization that can help us to address the current problems of today or are there very com different problems because of the international level? Um, so that is one question. And then uh, so I think my question is what is unique about turning wages into capital as opposed to other notions of capitalization and um, can they be related in any way? Yes, so my question is, uh, so in your paper we see that when there's a change of playing field from the local and state to the federal, there is a lack of know-how by some reformers or progressives in how to deal with contestation, let's say. So taking that into account, what, what do you think it does mean for today's where uh, financial markets operate in a globalized sphere, mostly through uh, the city of London or New York. So wh what space does this give for contestation? Because we see that in your paper, uh, this contestation is what uh, shapes financial markets. I is that possible today? Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, uh, well, thank you. I'm going to keep the questions here this way I have them in mind. Uh, thank you for your very nice discussion. I think it was very interesting to see where you, what lines you could draw because, of course, the paper needs to be limited in, in time and space. And so, of course, there's like a, a lot of things I couldn't do. Uh, uh, I think you were really on point with some of the things you said, actually, because since, since my dissertation, I've been working in two directions, which is housing and data. So I think you, you got it right on that because... <laughs> Uh, so one of the things I, I, this connects to some of the questions, but uh, one of the things I do right now is actually trying to compute a, 
a measure of, uh, of rent extraction on the housing market. So no, not for people who actually buy houses, but for people who have to pay rent. So the, uh, the idea is that you have to compare how much the person pays for the rent compared to the amount of the, the price of the good for the landlord. So the idea is to have a, a sort of measure of rent extraction on the housing market, so which we have very little information about, like, do poor people pay more for their, when they are tenants for their housing? So this is actually an interesting question because uh, it directly connects to the idea that housing is more and more used as a form of capital for, for a set of very different actors. I mean, from, from large investment funds who speculate with inner city, you know, uh, dilapidated neighborhoods such as BlackRock and everything, but also for, for, for small uh, uh, landowners who, who rent houses. Like, like in the US, there's a lot of things with abandoned houses, for instance, that you can buy on a very low price, and then you don't put a lot of efforts into it. Uh, but because it's in the middle of Chicago, then you can ask for a huge uh, rent, even though the, 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 the house is worth nothing. You bought it basically for the, for the amount of taxes that the people didn't pay before. That's, <laughs> and so I think there's a really an interesting thing when it comes to that. Uh, and with respect to data, I think it's, it's also really interesting. Actually, uh, in the same uh, volume that this paper is from, there is an article by Katharina Pistor, who wrote the book on, the, on legal, the, the code of capital that you call it. It's a very interesting book because it's, 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 she's, not a, she's not an economist and she's not a, a sociologist. She's a legal scholar, so she has these uh, very strong ideas about legal coding and everything. But I think for us, social scientists, it's still very stimulating. And, Discussion. We had. I remember when she came to present the book in Paris was like two years ago. She, we had really nice discussions about data because, like, that was one of the questions I asked. She doesn't talk about it in the book. Like, how is data a form of asset? You know, especially in non-contemporary world. For, from, from. But this goes to fintech. But it's also when you think about like uh, most of the big platforms. You know, they use data as a form of, of, of capital to to monetize their services. Right. That's why Google is free and so on. And everybody's talking about this right now. But the, there's some sort of legal coding. And so it raises many different issues. Like, is there a market for data? Uh, should there be a market for data? And uh, who are the actors who play a role into the whole thing? But it's a, it's a, it's a whole field of research that is, is interesting. So I think it was really good that you pointed to that. Um, uh, so I'm going to try to answer the question, um, if I understand them correctly. So uh, regarding the first que question, one of the things I would say is that in the US, for instance, uh, credit has always been used as a uh, substitute for a welfare state. <laughs> it's precisely because you don't have any welfare state that people have to get access to these loans, right? But it's sort of the elephant in the room in the sense that no one ever talks about this. So even if you go to like Obama and Elizabeth Warren and so on, they, they always say like, oh, we need to cut down on these loans and we need to make sure that consumer finance works well and people have information, they have protection and so on. But the, the big thing is like, yeah, but what if they had their medical bills covered by the state? What if they had uh, more benefits, you know, when it came to all sorts of things, from education to, 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 to health, right? They, do, they wouldn't have to resort to all these loans, right? Because this is some sort of what we call credit welfare, because people res rely on these things for, for their welfare, right? So, so I think this is, a, this is an interesting thing because we always, it's, it's kind of like the wrong fight, right? So if, uh, if, uh, if the political elites continue to, to focus on these things, sometimes they miss a larger thing, which is also harder to push politically. Like, if, of course, a reform of the welfare state, especially in the US, is very hard to push. Like every time there's like one step forward, there's two, two steps backwards and so on. So I think in that sense, it, 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 it uh, looking back at this era is also interesting because of this, because you, I don't know, there's a lot today of, of nostalgia for the progressive era. Like you have a lot of people who look back at the progressive era when there were all these, these reformist momentum and energy and say like, oh, it was better at the time. Like academics were more involved in the political life and antitrust was really big. Uh, nowadays people are going, you know about this hipster antitrust thing that you're, Maybe that doesn't ring any bell, but it's like this idea that we should go back to the Louis Brandeis 1920s sort of regulation of, of, of monopolies. Uh, this is all very strange to me because it's, it's very anachronistic because most of the people that we covered today were like, as we say, I mean, as we saw, a lot of them were actually like racist white people, which is very strange like to, to kind of go back to that time and say like, oh, they actually had really nice ideas about political involvement. And it's not about to criticize these people, it's just to say that, uh, uh, 
each specific time has its own way of thinking, uh, and we should really pay attention to the sort of thing that we, we try to push as policy decisions, because uh, when the policy decision, decisions are not well informed, it can lead to very strange consequences. And so, first of all, like, we need serious work. And then, then you can think about, uh, um, about political action. Uh, so the second question, um, I mean, there's a lot of debates now in sociology about capitalization. Uh, uh, Fabian Muniesa, which I, I mean, I, you prob I don't know if you know about him, but sometimes people read him in, in, um, in economics. He, they wrote a really big book on capitalization, where they look at uh, all sorts of different forms of capitalization from, like, I don't know. Yeah, so uh, if you want, uh, I think I quote the book in the, in the paper, but it's, a, it's an interesting thing. And I don't really agree with this, side, this type of work because they mostly don't talk about law. They talk only about, uh, about science and technology, basically, as being needing device to, 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 to turn something into capital. And some of the things that I tried to do was to apply a more of a legal, political uh, vision to this, because it's not only technology that produces these conflicts, it's also like people who actually fight for this. And, um, and uh, I think the, the third question, um, I think I have to, to, to have make a little comment on, the, on the, the presentation that you did overall, I, it, just to, to clarify some of the things. Like, um, like it, it's, a, it's an interesting act thing, actually. But when we talk about regulation, uh, we don't mean re like it's very hard to make like interdisciplinary work when it comes to regulation because uh, in France is, obviously there's the regulation school and so when we talk about regulation it kind of like goes back to that theory and it connects on some level but in sociology and especially in political science there is like a mountain of literature on regulation which has really nothing to do with the sort of thing that the regulation school is interested in. Why? Because uh, the regulation school deals with massive like blocks, like historical blocks that move and sort of, it's like a very techno tectonic approach to you know, capitalism. Like it, 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 these sort of conflicts uh, happen at a very high level of abstraction to some degree. There's like labor and capital, right? And, and, these things. and uh, when we talk about, we, I mean like sociologists and political scientists, talk about regulation, we talk about how the, the really the social, like the, the detail of how, how regulation happens. How can you create policies that actually change the world? Because it's not so obvious, right? Sometimes you said it, right? Like the, especially in the financial world, you create a policy, but it's already too late, right? The, the, the people who know the, the, the market have, have already moved on. So that's the big issue. Like how do you adapt constantly? And we need more sociological work devoted to these things, right? Like, uh, especially because the people who actually make the regulation are not usually trade unions. They're not people in the streets who are asking for stuff. Like people who, are, who create the regulation are usually experts who circulate in specific circles, whether it be the European Union or, or the French high administration or the transnational organizations of commerce or whatever. And so uh, like in terms of contestation, there is a decoupling that is very hard to it's not hard to understand, but it's, it's very hard to accept to some degree. It's that there is, on the one hand, civil society, which has, has, has a very hard time like, pushing for specific regulation. And then you have uh, the experts of regulation who are very technical. And, deal with, and, and I'm not talking about finance, but more generally about this whole like, sociology of regulation. And all they try to do is to create compliance. So how do you make sure that market actors actually comply with the law, right? And, um, and uh, I think it would be interesting to have more connections with those things because sometimes those, those studies of like compliance studies and everything, they're very, like they're close to management studies because they really want to understand how, um, how do experts interact with market actors. And uh, it's very depoliticized in that sense. Like, uh, uh, and, and on the other hand, when you have the regulation school and so on, you, nev you never see like actors, institutions, organizations. You know, it remains at this very abstract level and for empiricists, you know, like who want to do like really concrete work, it's very hard to use this theory, right? Because uh, you don't even know like what is labor and what is capital in that sense. You know, like is it is it labor unions? Is it like in my case, for instance, who's who's the side of capital? For instance, like in the story I was just telling, you have basically these elite guys who are not the federal government, and they're fighting for the working class, but also sort of against them 
and they're fighting for a class of lenders who are not the big trust that we usually associate with that time, but there's still some companies, you know, so it, it's a little bit more messy than, uh, than, than that. And, um, and just one last point, so it was kind of interesting to see, uh, I don't know if you can go back, just to illustrate what I just said about like these conflicting disciplinary uh, methodologies. Like for instance, uh, my work really is here, is on that line. <laughs> is like in between those two things, right? So, so uh, this is true and this is true as well, but how do you transition from, from, from that side to the other? So for instance, the regulation tool will, will focus long-term evolutions. Let's say there's blocks that move together and at some point some takes over and then and whatever. But the, the, what I'm really interested, what I was really interested in my dissertation, for instance, was specifically understanding the transition between the progressive era and the New Deal because, for instance, a lot of the people that worked on these credit matters that I just talked about, they uh, got jobs in the New Deal administration, you know? And they were some of the guys who pushed for the big credit reforms that we know, uh, that we usually associate with the, with the New Deal, right? And it's the same when it comes to uh, the policies, the, the interest rate I just talked about, like the, this policy with higher interest rate, right? It, I mean, it's, it, it, it spilled over the third period because it still exists at the state level, right? But then you had this sort of federal stuff that was added to all this. But it doesn't mean that uh, there's no spillover. For instance, like the, the notion that credit market should be regulated at the national level is something that is very new in the 1930s. Like ask if you, I'm not, I can say that, but if you ask someone in the 1910, if some trend, like credit transaction in Nebraska has an effect to, you know, on the supply of credit in California, people will laugh at you, like saying like, no, this, these things have nothing to do with one another, right? So the, the, even the idea that you have an interconnected market, that you need to regulate it, is, is very new in that sense in the 1930s, but it connects to these former struggles, right? Because it created some sort of national idea that you know, these things were relevant on a higher level. And I think it's interesting because you can see that the interest rate, for instance, used to be a strictly legal tool. It was a, a legal tool for protection, and it slowly, slowly, slowly moved to something that was like a macroeconomic instrument, you know, that was, uh, that was used to regulate production and consumption and surplus and everything, all the Keynesian thing that you all know. And it's interesting because there, it's, not a sh it's not a break, it's not a revolution from the progressive era, but it's more of a gradual shift. And, uh, and I think there's a lot of stuff that sort of spills over from, from here to here. And you could make the same argument from the third period to the fourth period. Um, I mean, so this is usually the struggle that I have with these big blocks is that you don't really see like how, how the shift happened and also the sort of things that spill over from one period to another. But it's more of a disciplinary lens than just a, a critique of the, of the regulations. Cool.